This is Mohanraj and Rosenbaum are humans. I'm Marianne Mohanraj, and I'm here with. I am uh, Ben Rosenbaum, also <laughs> sort of, also purported human, and our guest. <laughs> and our guest. Uh, uh, do I say it or? <laughs> yeah, you say it. You uh, say okay, it. okay. Uh, Yvette Lisa Ndohu. Thank you. Um, that actually makes it less likely that we'll mispronounce your name, but not impo- <laughs> not impossible. <laughs> we'll do our best. So, um, uh, Yvette, I'm going to introduce. Welcome. Her. Welcome. Yvette. Welcome. I'm going to introduce her. I, I like. I have her bio up. It's Go. so. It's so impressive. Um, she's so. Sorry, I'm like, I'm like, she's so young. Uh, she's now you're doing thing where you're like, she's so, so young. You're so young to have done so much, but it's okay. It's just because <laughs> ben, ben and I are are, hit, are in our uh, 50s and are like feeling it. So I know. So, but, uh, <laughs> so uh, Yvette Lisa Nadlovu, hope, I don't know how I did there, but hopefully reasonably well, is a Zimbabwean Sarangona. No, I got that wrong. Sarangano. Sarangano. Yeah, Sarangano. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Storyteller. Um, uh, she is uh, finishing up an MFA right now and teaches in the writing program at UMass Amherst. She's taught at Clarion West, um, or done a BA at Cornell, and is a 2021 Tin House Scholar, which is pretty awesome. Um, she's the 2020... Wait, fiction- you mean she went to Clarion? You just went to Clarion West, right? Or am I wrong? Yeah. Yeah, so I went to uh, Client West this year, and then uh-huh. I also taught online. Oh, on the online? Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's ex- ben and I are both alums, and we'll be teaching at Clarion West this coming summer, so we're excited nice. about it. It's going to be Ooh. fun. Um, yeah. Is it going to be in person? I can't that is un- unclear you know. at the current moment. Yeah, I think <laughs> so, that's yeah. In- we're, being decided yeah, we're, in we're these hoping, pandemic we're hoping, times. Yes, so... Um, okay, so wait, we'll more, ask about more, that, but I'll let Marianne finish yeah, the intro, yes, but yes, I also want to more, hear about it. More intro, more intro, 2020 fiction winner of Columbia Journal's Women History Month special issue, co-founder of Voodoo Not Summer Workshop for Black SFF writers. Her work's been anthologized in Tor.com, Faya Literary Magazine's Breathe Faya Anthology, Voices of African Women Journal. Okay, there's a bunch of awards, et cetera, so on and so forth here. She's also- We'll published. just wade through all your awards. Yes, yeah, SFF, <laughs> SFF and F, um, et cetera. So you bursting onto the scene in very exciting Wait, but you got to so. say the name of the collection. That she has well, out, and we're, coming okay, out. Okay, yes, and we will be talking <laughs> today, uh, among other things, about her new book, um, which let me just make sure I have the title right. Uh, coming out from University Press of Kentucky, and it is, of course, like drinking from graveyard wells. So <laughs> is the title. So and it, it's it not out yet. You sent us copies, but when when does it come out? Uh, it comes out in March next year, so March okay. 7. Cool. All right, so this is the perfect time to go and place your pre-orders. Um, That's right. If you're hearing important. this, if if we manage to if we manage to ship this podcast before March of 2023, it's the perfect time. If 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 not, it's the perfect time to go buy it. <laughs> not as a pre-order. That's right. <laughs> because our record okay. of shipping podcast episodes promptly leaves something to be desired. <laughs> Anyway, so um, so so there's the intro, and now now we're gonna. So let me jump in. Yvette and I were talking beforehand just a little bit about um, where sort of our our cultural background and our writing and how that plays in. And I was I was telling her that since I left Sri Lanka when I was two and a half, even though a lot of my work centers around Sri Lanka, it's um, from a very diasporan perspective, and. Um, I, you know, we've gone back to visit several times, but of course, because of the conflict that um, was happening for about 30 years, uh, it became much less safe to visit. And we we did so, we barely went for, for quite a long time. And so um, now when I talk to contemporary science fiction fantasy writers like Yudhanjaya Vitretna, um, it's, it's, it's clear that we're coming from very different perspectives. Um, and so um, you uh, grew up in Zimbabwe and came to the U.S. as an adult for college, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe can you, I don't know whether you feel like um, you you see that kind of difference, you feel a difference in um, writing out of that experience versus, I don't know if you feel like a diasporan or if this is more of a sojourn. Um, 
in the U.S. <laughs> so, sorry, that was a really vague question, but it's a bunch. There's a bunch of stuff there that you could talk around. Anything <laughs> that interests you in there? Yeah, um, I certainly feel that way because I've been here for only um, six years, um, and so like, and I haven't been back uh, home uh, since then. Mm -hmm. So it feels like. Zimbabwe and my, you know, my hometown Blawa is kind of like stuck mm -hmm. in uh, in my memory of when I left it. But things have changed oh, wow. in just six years, and so that was an eventful um, six years, right, for Zimbabwe too. So. Yeah, yeah, it was. You know, because when I, you know, I grew up in Zimbabwe, it was under the Mugabe dictatorship yeah. all my life, and you know, we actually had a lot of like myths around him that um, he was immortal. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, like oh, you know, he ate, and I have a story in the collection about that. So the myth is that he ate the heart of a turtle, and turtles live for uh you know 200 years 100 years wow, so yeah because he eaten the heart of a turtle he's immortal <laughs> so yeah. i grew up believing that you know the dictator was immortal too because yeah he'd been there uh, my whole life and so when i came here uh, a military coup happened and the vice president is now the current uh president so you know a lot has you know happened and in my mind i'm still back you know six years um, before. So I do kind of, you know, struggle with that is, you know, you know, what has changed and, you know, I'm, you know, writing from that experience of, you know, six years ago and that, you know, might be a little different from what is on the ground right now. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I had a conversation with a writer in Sri Lanka who was talking about how I had, I should be careful writing about political events in Sri Lanka because I was not, he didn't think I was a stakeholder in the same way that somebody living there was. Um, and it really gave me pause. I was working at the time on a book about a, a, a freedom fighter, a Tamil woman, um, a member of the LTTE and the, the, the Tigers. And, um, and I realized that in order to do the book justice, to do her story justice, I would have to do a, I would either have to go back or at the very least do a ton of research, right? Because otherwise I would be working off of sort of like a mishmash of like memories and, um, you know, probably faulty impressions from the news and so on, right? And I ended up putting the book aside because I was like, it's, it's not that I can't do this book, but the amount of work that would go into it to do it right was more work mm -hmm. than I wanted to do, right? At that yeah. point. So, um, but it, it's it's a tricky issue for people who who emigrate, right? Even even part, you know, temporarily emigrate, right? As this kind of like, I don't think we want to say you don't have the right to write about back home, right? So, well, um, and it feels like there's another layer too, because well, I don't know that much about like censorship culture in Sri Lanka, but I mean in the there's a story in the collection in which somebody mm -hmm. gets murdered by the security services for basically criticizing the government. So there's a way in which it's like that. Yeah. It seems like an, and I don't know what it's like now versus then and whatever, but it seems like it's an environment where maybe there's also, um, you know, on the one hand, there's like, well, I'm not there. So do I get to speak? But on the other hand, it's like, well, I'm not there. So I maybe can speak more freely. So I, I don't know if that's another layer of, you know, consideration. Right. Or... Well, no, that was that was sort of part of his point was that, you know, if I said something critical about Prabhakaran, the leader of the Tigers, it was unlikely that he would come knocking on my door, that he would send people to Chicago to, you know, whereas if I were in Colombo writing this, I would be at much more risk. And so well, I don't know about Colombo, but I mean, I'm just saying it. it yeah, it, there's there are cases where you might feel, oh, I shouldn't speak. But there are also cases where you say, well, if not me, then who, mm. you know? Because I because I won't get the knock on my door, um, right, right, right. No, no, I the yeah, and I think that's. It's, I'm it's, talking more about. I mean, I want to more hear what event has. I I know I get that's not necessarily relevant to your case with the tigers, but uh, anyway. So. No, 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 no. It is relevant. That's that was what I was yeah. trying to say. It's exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is the same thing, but I, you know, it's it's. I guess I would say it's it's easy to feel like, um, oh, I can speak, and so I should, but 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 kind of bracketed by i have to be careful that i'm speaking correctly right if i'm mm. do, does that make sense like it's yeah i don't know about <laughs> we'll, we'll let you talk the finger gesture now yeah <laughs> yeah i guess it's a matter of like navigating your privilege because you know you have this privilege of 
you're, you're, you're safely in the U.S., you know, away from, you know, the military forces, away from mm-hmm. uh, censorship. And you also still kind of, in my case, I do feel that sense self-censorship sometimes because, you know, I still have my parents back home and, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. I will go back. So I always, you know, I'm always conscious of, uh, yeah. of that as well. So, you know, I think, you know, what are you doing, you know, with your safety here? And I think it is important for me to, you know, talk about it, you know, talk about our experiences with uh, under the Mugabe di- dictatorship and, you know, talk about what's, you know, going on now because, you know, a lot of people back home can't. Yeah. The this the story Ben references from the collection, it's from Plum Tree True Stories and it's uh, part of the Basket Woman piece. And I'm I'm curious, you know, you subtitle that True Stories and uh, you 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 name the woman Gusheshe, uh, a comedian from a small town in Zimbabwe. So is is the story you tell here based on a true story? It is okay. Yeah, uh, it is based on a true uh, on a true story. So I changed the comedian's uh, name, but um, yes, it was a comedian. She was you know getting really popular doing these YouTube skits, these you know Instagram videos, you know, really funny. And she was, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Trevor Noah on the Daily Show commenting mm-hmm. on politics, commenting on people in power. And um, you know, she was kidnapped by the security forces and uh some of the details in the story, you know, did happen uh to her. And then, you know, they um let her go. Um they, you know, stripped her naked and dropped her off in the middle of the city. And um in real life, luckily, there were good Samaritans who, um, you know, got her off the streets and, you know, got her help. But, you know, that is uh, an incredibly dangerous situation for a woman back home, uh, again, because of um, a lot of the mythology is that uh, witches, you know, right, right around on um, flying baskets uh, naked. And so when uh, when it, the sun comes out, they lose the fuel for their baskets and they drop out of the sky. And so if you see like a woman naked in the street, it's most likely that she's, you know, a witch who's dropped out of right. the sky because it's now daylight. So it's very dangerous. You know, they did that deliberately because they know that, you know, if they drop her oh. off in an area where people believe this, you know, then she might be in danger. People will, you know, either attack her oh, or wow. they're afraid. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but luckily, you know, that wasn't huh. the case for her. So, you know, my story wanted to explore that, you know, what was the intention behind doing that they wanted to shame her but wow. they also wanted to put her uh in danger wow i hadn't even i you know i it, one of the interesting things uh, in this the the collection is the way that you um are taking like real things and mashing them up with fantastical things or mashing up different things and and mixing and matching them and i i I ended up you know i mean (laughs) i don't know if i've gone to wikipedia quite as much reading a lot of (laughs) a lot of other work recently because it's like is this what is the what what is that and i mean a lot of the and also the language i mean which is fun it was fun trying to you know um decode the things that weren't you know um i like that when people don't I mean, we've had this conversation a bunch of the podcast about like when you're presenting something like how much do you like, um, you know, translate everything so it'll be very accessible to a wider audience versus, of course, that dilutes it somewhat sometimes. And you want to have the authenticity of and So I like the I like the uh, richness of even the stuff I didn't. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that went over my head and I, mm. you know, was very aware of that and fine with it. Um, but one of the things but I was like, oh, I was relating to that story like you're taking these two things and mashing them up or particularly when you're telling now it was like oh i see you took this traditional belief you wanted to folkloric magic belief you want to talk about and then like what the oppression that's happening now and like kind of mashing those up but like what i didn't expect you to say now was like they probably had that in mind like they were thinking about the witchcraft thing yeah. so that's that's mm-hmm. kind of amazing but there's other cases where like i, I love the story with lift where like yeah. where you've kind of like uh you know mashed up different and i, I went to go read about the history of lift i was like what's this because it's too. like you know it's interesting <laughs> how it was like okay put these two people in one in well one it's, guy. it's very it's very close i think so that story right it's the second story in the book second place is the first loser um i thought that was fascinating i I, you know the first story has a ghost element in it you know i started reading and i was like okay is this a speculative collection is it a mainstream collection is it a mix most of the (laughs) most of it is is speculative very clearly there are fantastical elements the second story i don't think has any fantastical elements but it's sort of an alternate history in a way Mm. in in that you have um taken a, a lot of the actual history of Lyft, which used to be Zimride, which was inspired by um, by uh, cultural practices in in Zimbabwe, 
um, which I had no idea. And I say, speaking yeah, of someone who uses Lyft quite a bit. So I, <laughs> I appreciate that piece of education. Uh, and then, and then, you know, layering it into this story about um, Zimmerman, who I think was was not the actual person who went to Zimbabwe. It was the other guy. Um, well, it's a, it feels like the Zimmerman character is a mashup of the two people. Yeah, yeah right. Neither of them is one of them's John Zimmer, and the yeah. other is. Yeah. Something else. Green. Green. Maybe. Yeah. So. Logan Green. Yeah. I just saw, read this on Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, yes. What and then okay. she, you mashed them up. The, the, I have to say, I have to say that the reason I like specifically remember the names is that I was like, did because you turned him into Seth Zimmerman. I, I don't know if it's I don't know if this is clear, but this is yeah, like reading from was, my uh, filter. Chad Zimmerman, I think. Oh, Chad. Chad, Chad, yeah. Chad Zimmerman. That's who right. Did, Chad did, Zimmerman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, yeah, who yeah, did yeah. not know? Anyway, so that and that's a perfect yeah. like. Yeah, 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 and it's it's um. Why did I think Seth? That's really interesting. Anyway, yes, I that was from some, that was maybe another story or something. Anyway, um, but yeah, but but I found it fun how it 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 mashed up the you know how you were. I mean, I think that's less, the, you you were Marianne. You were just saying like it. it this collection was this story was speculative and this story was but i sort of feel like the collection in some ways defies this line mm -hmm. like in a way i mean it's kind of like i think the collection is resistant to being sorted into yeah, genre yeah. and not and um and then, and and i saw that as kind of i mean i don't know you know i'm obviously like we've never met so but there's a there's a there's a there are certain themes that you're exploring and and one of them is like this thing about being an expatriate, you know, Zimbabwe and like going and being in these privileged spaces. And then and so it it sort of felt in that story less like it's an alternate history and more like you're sort of imagining yourself or someone like you kind of like you mm -hmm. into the story. Like, what if, you know, what if this was back? You know, like what what would this experience be like if, mm -hmm. you know, because it, you know, it was like he went to Zimbabwe and found out about this thing. Well, was there maybe. You know, what if there was somebody along for the ride who was a Zimbabwean, you know, who who sees both of these worlds, who comes back, and then mm -hmm. the, but then and the heart of the story really is between the protagonist and her father. I feel like, and mm -hmm. that like exploring that relationship. And I'm not going to spoiler the ending, but I did not see it coming. I I thought it was a mm -hmm. powerful like floor like the very last moment in the story was like. I was like, that's not where I thought this was going to go, <laughs> which I thought was terrific. Thank you. You know, yeah, those I are some things I was uh, I was thinking about because, um, you know, with the founder of Lyft, you know, went to Zimbabwe and, you know, so kind of like our community ride sharing because, yeah. um, you know, we don't have a lot of like re reliable public transportation. So if somebody has a car and they're, you know, driving in the same direction as you, you know, you can hail them down and they'll pick you up and you give them a small tip as, you know, thank you. So, you know, it's not kind of like this capitalistic thing because you know now with like lyft and uber you know uh workers don't the, the, yeah. you know the workers don't have rights so i you know i was thinking about you know how do you take this community thing this nice thing that people were doing for each other mm -hmm. um and you know kind of turn it into uh you know a company that has you know all this uh, all these problems and then you know i was also thinking of um because there's a scene in there about the Victoria Falls and the Victoria right. Falls are these, you know, beautiful uh, falls back home. And, you know, in the history books, it says that, you know, the Scottish or British um, explorer David Livingston is the one that mm. discovered the falls. Right. But, you know, that is <laughs> that is incorrect. There were, you know, people living, indigenous tribes living yeah. You know, mm -hmm. around that area, and it was you know uh, a guide that took him uh, right. to the walls <laughs> to <discovered>. show him <laughs> the walls. But, you know, right. in, in the history, it's like we book, go here all the time. You want to see it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you know, you know, I, in the history books, it's he discovered it. So right. I was thinking about that history in connection with Lyft. Like you know, obviously there was somebody who had to you know, show him how to use uh, a lift because, you know, yeah. it's, it, you know, it's not intuitive. You right. have to kind of figure out, you know, how to hail the people down, yeah. you know, and stuff yeah. and how to communicate where you're going, where they can drop you off because there's no, there's no app. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, somebody had yeah. to show him how to yeah. do that. So I was thinking, you know, what would that character, you know, mm -hmm. look like? And mm -hmm. then when I was, you know, Googling the founders, I actually discovered that one of them went to um, Cornell University, where I did uh -huh. my undergrad. Yeah, so yeah. Kind of made those connections that oh, maybe right. it might have been you know another international student who right. you know, took him back you know there over the summer, and mm. you know that's where the story kind of started from there. 
I really, yeah. I love the moment in the story when he's gone to the falls and he's come back and is talking about it. And her father is like, why didn't you correct him? You know, and right. then she's telling, he's telling uh, Chad the actual history and chad is you know chad says very politely thank you for the education or something like that and like you know but then but he, uploads it without editing his video right? yeah, exactly. exactly that was, that was amazing so that that was such drawn. a snarky moment because he, <laughs> he could have edited he could have added an addendum he could have been like you know yeah. how oh, you know my host has taught me that I you know completely misunderstood this history, but no, no, he's not going to. And do it's that. kind of uh, it's kind of great that he's this sort of soft spoken modern day uh, Livingstone, right? He's like mm-hmm. coming, he's like completely, and he's yeah. like, oh, I appreciate your culture so much. It's like a different vibe, yeah. right? It's like Livingstone <laughs> is all like, I will teach these savages. And he's like, wow, you guys are so intuitive, and then it's like <laughs> literally doing the same thing with like twenty first century yeah. flair, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So maybe we could pick up a little bit on this idea of, you know, Ben says the collection kind of resists um, being speculative, not so, which is, you know, which is true. Like the, I think you move very fluidly between um, pieces that have fantastical elements and don't. And, you know, I, you know, partly I was coming into it with this genre lens and looking for that. But as I read into it, I stopped caring, right? Like, um, and I was just sort of right. reading piece by piece. And, the, and, and, and also it's a lot of yeah. the fantastical elements. It's like, a, as in the story we just mentioned, where it's like, they drop her off thinking she's going to be taken for a witch, which is realistic. But also it's like, do you know what I mean? Like it's uh, the fantastical mm-hmm. elements, they're not fantastic to some of the characters. It's not like that very simple line of like, oh, it's magic. That It's like, right. you know, it's like very much, it's magical realist in that sense. So, I mean, some of it, I think. Maybe could you could you could you talk a little bit <laughs> how you how you um were were sort of formulating the the collection mm. event so yeah um I think it comes from my own cultural uh, background as a Zimbabwean and I think in general African culture is that we kind of, the fantastic is kind of like rubbed against the mundane the everyday like the mm-hmm. uh, the example of you know the belief in like witches and that. You know, they drop from the sky when the sun comes out. And, you know, uh, you know, people believe that. And I mentioned that earlier. I thought, you know, my country's dictator was immortal. So yeah. the fantastic mm-hmm. is always part of the yeah. everyday. And, you know, people use the fantastic to understand what is going on. You know, you know that it's wrong for somebody to be the president of a country for 30, 40 years. You know that's mm-hmm. wrong. And then you kind of use this mythology of he's immortal you know, mm-hmm. to, you know, kind of understand mm-hmm. how, you know, bizarre and wrong um, that is. And so that's yeah. kind of like what we do back home is mm-hmm. kind of use mythology to, you know, understand the real world. And my storytelling kind of comes from that history. There's another example where yeah, they're, I wonder. In the, it, it, where she's in the story where the, the which I love, the the one that's in, where they're about like refugees in, 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 essentially a mm. uh, magical South Africa uh, where they're uh, where they have the, the naturalization priests who mm. are, I mean, the I'm assuming home, South Africa. This is a home. Home, became, is, a thing with home became a thing of Thor, which is such a great line, such a great title. And the, mm. one of the great things about it is that it, 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 you expect with that title, the story to be about to be set in and to show, but what's in, so interesting about it is that you're seeing this. We never see what's actually happening back home. We never see it in detail. The whole story, like it's more terrifying because what they're going through in this place they've landed, which is like a South Africa, um, I'm assuming from my Googling, um, like they, they, that's so dystopian, but they constantly are like, well, this is better than the other thing, <laughs> than the thing with thorns. So the thing with thorns mm-hmm. occupied, this is a great technique of the of horror and the fantastic. It's like, it's even worse because we don't know quite what's happening. And the only time they really do explain what's happening is sort of, as you say, it's in a, when she's telling the children, um, uh, she tells it in this mythological way. And I mean, that's exactly what you're saying. It's sort of like, to, it's like, there's no way to explain this except to i mean or the best way to explain this or the the way that that will make the most sense especially to these children is like you know well it's these demons who have who have taken over our country and yeah mm-hmm. yeah um yeah and that you know that story is like a mashup of south africa and the u.s so uh, okay um, yeah, <laughs> right so that's they, true because the naturalization is def- it's probably more of a uh-huh 
Yeah, yeah. So it's both, you know, experiences like with some of my family has immigrated to South Africa and there's a lot uh-huh. of xenophobia there uh, right now. And, you know, I've immigrated to U.S. and kind of dealing with <laughs> the immigration right. system here. So I kind of right. meshed up those two experiences to kind of create right. this, um, oh, interesting. Yeah. hybrid uh, hybrid space. But, you know, going okay. back to the question of, you know, kind of blurring the lines between, you know, the real and the fantastic, I've kind of struggled with how to... Um, talk about my work like what umbrella to put it is Mm -hmm. it magical realism is it realism is it fantasy and I've kind of landed on uh, afro surrealism um, Mm -hmm. to describe Mm -hmm. uh, my work so afro surrealism is about uh, telling the experience of the contemporary the contemporary black experience and uh, talking about you know the real life horrors like you know racism colonialism capitalism but using, you know, the fantastic to talk about those real things. And I mm-hmm. uh, I think, you know, my work, I'm starting to think of my term, my work in terms of uh, being more Afro uh, surrealist in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. I like that term. I haven't run across it before. I don't know if you invented it, but it's a good term. It, it, I think it does a good job of capturing <laughs> um, the feel of your work, right? Um, the And I think it's surreal in particular because... I think one of the things that I like, for example, with that story, um, there's this, there's, so what's, for those who haven't read it yet, which you should go read it, um, the the naturalization priests are, t- in order to become a citizen, to become naturalized, you, they, you have to give up, they choose something for you to give up that is an incredibly valuable thing to you. So at the beginning of the story, the protagonist's friend, the painter, they take away his eyes. Um, and and it, it really kind of, the whole story, I think, raises this question of, you know, emigration as a, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of emigration, right? And I think it made me think about, you know, my parents who came to the U.S. thinking they'd work for a few years and then go home and did not, like, like many other emigrants. Um, and my dad getting, uh, you know, the letter on that super thin onion skin paper telling him mm. that his father had died, right? Like mm. the things that you don't even realize that you have given up in this choice, right? Mm. That then get get taken from you. And, you know, and you think, you know, well, I'll go, I'll work for a little while, I'll be, I'll make money, then I'll be able to go back home. And that ends up with capitalism, et cetera, it ends up being much harder than you mm you might have expected when you were I don't know my my parents you know definitely heard like the streets of America are paved with gold as a kind of you know mm-hmm. narrative right and so go become rich and then come back and help everybody else right and so um anyway so I I, I just felt the story captured that really well and then the I don't want to give away too much there there's a moment where she, <laughs> she, gets, to, she gets to do something that uh that is a sort of redemptive moment that is that is surreal in how it's presented and i had this like uh-huh, i was sort of uh-huh. you know looking at yeah this and thinking, like yeah there's no there's there's no there's no mechanism suggested <laughs> well, and, 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 and it, without without a surreal operation like there's no way to do this in the real world uh-huh, there's uh-huh. no you know like you need to have a little bit of weirdness to make it yeah possible to even partially fix these things right so yeah i don't know so it was, i was thinking about that when i was when i was reading that piece um and how how it operates it's it's funny you know i i think when we talk about magical realism we do talk about sort of cultures where the the supernatural and the natural are not as distinct as or like there's a accepted supernatural overlay to the world i sometimes i feel like you know, even when we 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 talk as if it's not like that in America, like we're all <laughs> modern and rationalistic, and that's just not the case. You know, like even for little things, like you know, there's that line about step on a crack, break your mother's back, mm-hmm. right? And after I told my kids that line, it's we were mm. walking down the street and they started deliberately stepping on the cracks, and I was like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> like, you know, like, it's not that I believe nice. it, but like, like but come, come on, on. <laughs> yeah, right? So, um, so, 
you know, like who deliberately walks under a ladder or crosses a back black cat? I mean, you know, you were, why would you invite the gods to, to you know, frown on you? So anyway. <laughs> All right. Um... right. But the but the difference <laughs> is that while of course people continue to be people and therefore not necessarily like like the that there's this artificial notion that we're going to put all of our eggs in one basket of belief and belief. These are the things that I agree to. But actually, as humans r- operating in the world, and this is actually rational, we're like maybe I just won't tempt the gods, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're like maybe I'll I'll distribute my eggs among many baskets of possible metaphysics in my behavior at least. But in the in the in the tradition in the West, and this is what sort of happened to fantasy fiction as a created as a you know a, a, a hypostatized thing, is that like we're going to act rhetorically as if there's like this worldview that we subscribe to, and we're gonna you know ghettoize, we're gonna like banish everything that defies it to be like, well, that is a fantasy, you know what I mean? And so that that like it's not that people live like that, but like organizing your library like that is very like was a very big project right in in, in it really only in the 20th century you know i mean in the 19th century everybody could write you know it was wasn't much of a all the literary writers are writing about ghosts it's whatever but like yeah. there became with the sort of professionalization of of you know literature and stuff there was sort of and, and i think lit- academic causation in a way was like mm-hmm. these are the this is high art because it doesn't trade in these supernatural this supernatural nonsense and then there's like you know fantastical literature which is you know fine if it's a metaphor or whatever (laughs) are you do you do you feel like you've gotten pushback or resistance at all in using these elements in your work when you're because you publish in both genre publications and you know what would be mainstream type publications right Mm. um or I, I don't know. I would like to think that that we've gotten better about this, <laughs> that that there isn't quite as much prejudice against um, these elements uh, in mainstream lit as there was, say, 20, 30 years ago. But I don't know if you have a sense of that. Yeah, um, I guess with, like, with my experience with like the MFA space, uh, you know, usually it was only me or one other person, you know, writing mm-hmm. Uh, oh. you know, <laughs> fantasy Sorry, story. I did, I, did, I, I did my I did my MFA at Mills, uh, uh. which is, uh, which uh, yes, my my advisor did not know how to deal with genre. It's just mm. a lovely woman, and a, and and she tried her best, but but was, yeah. was like like told me she had no idea how to approach it, and um, and I was also one of the only people of color in the program, which is another uh, factor. Anyway, go on, go on. Sorry to interrupt, but. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when I was applying to MFAs, I had one piece that was, you know, genre and then the other was more realist. And, uh, you know, I wanted to put that genre piece in the application materials and I was told, no, 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 <laughs> you uh, know, you yeah. won't get in that way. Don't, you <laughs> <Right>. know, <laughs> don't put it in there. Uh, so, yeah, I feel like there is kind of like this kind of cloud of like, I don't know, shame around uh, genre writing in like uh, the MFA space. Um, and so which is why I appreciated uh, Clarion West. Because it was like, you know, the first time being in a workshop space and everybody's a genre writer. Everybody, you know, geeks out about dragons and uh-huh. all that. So it was such a different experience because most of the time I have to kind of like in workshops, like explain, you know, why is there, you know, a ghost? Why is there this strange right. thing, you know? Uh, and, you know, the people in workshop can treat it as this, ooh, this fancy thing. Look, you know, there's a there's a right. ghost. Yeah, mm-hmm. but, <laughs> you know, yeah. in at, at Claire and West, you know, I, I appreciated, you know, the opportunity to, you know, treat, you know, sci-fi and fantasy as, you know, serious, you know, literature, serious craft, and we could have these serious conversations that, I think, you know, I was kind of like lurking in other uh, workshop spaces I've been. I want to use that to segue and hear all about your Clarion West experience, because I like, who were your instructors? What was it like? And because I'm also curious about how it's changed over the, over, you know, it was, it was many years ago. When, <laughs> it was 20 some years ago when uh, Mary and I were there. So <clears throat> tell us all yeah. about it. Yeah, again, you know, uh, Clara Nurse was like transformative because it was my first time, you know, being around, you know, people who are geeking out uh, about the same things uh, as me. Uh, our instructors were um, Fonda Lee, uh, P. Jelly Clark, um, Bill Campbell, mm-hmm. um, uh, Charlie Jane Anders, um, and mm-hmm. I'm uh, forgetting some, but it was uh, really uh-huh. good. And I think wow. we were called the most international Clara Oh, really? Uh, 
class uh-huh. in history, which is interesting because wow. I'm from Zimbabwe. We had um, you know, people from Guyana, uh, the Dominican Republic, uh, Singapore. Um, Singapore. So it was, you know, really interesting to, you know, both be with genre writers and a lot of international yeah. writers who are writing from, you know, the diaspora experience mm-hmm. writing from their, you know, own folklore. So I I, you know, I had a good time. I was just I think I was more of a fan than a writer when I was there. I was like, <laughs> okay, the Caribbean folklore I I didn't know about it. Sounds, you know, similar to, you know, what we do back home. So I was just geeking out, you know, uh, the entire time nice. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. That's really cool. Um, I want to, so many topics I want to talk to you about. I, I'd like to pick up, um, I guess, sort of a question, maybe taking you back to the Zimbabwean material. And, you know, I'm, I am not, I'm actually not sure I've ever read anything from Zimbabwe before. And, you know, as, as with Ben, I, I ended up doing a bunch of Googling because I, didn't remember the political history and needed to refresh my memory. Um, And I'm curious whether you feel like your work is in conversation with other contemporary Zimbabwean writers or, um, or historical writers, you know, when I, and I guess I'm coming out of this. So let me, let me frame it this way. Yesterday uh, we did a panel with Beth Meacham, who's an editor at Tor. And one of the questions we asked her, um, and we'll have that up on the site soon, but one one of the questions I I asked her is, do you feel like science fiction fantasy writers should be reading more contemporary work like the Hugo and Nebula finalists of the year and so on to make their own work better? Should they be reading more of the classics? And she, um, she was sort of saying, well, you you should always read, you know, what you're hoping to sell. But she would say, don't even just read classic science fiction fantasy. She was saying, read biography, read poetry, read widely, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I'd agree with that. I, when I started writing Sri Lankan immigrant fiction, I there was not much out there, right, in English. And so um, there just wasn't much out there, period, I think. Um, but I can only read in English. And so, um, <laughs> right, right. I mean, like my, my sense is there was not be- much being published in Tamil and Sinhalese, but I don't I don't really necessarily know that for certain, right? Um, but it has a, Sri Lanka has a tiny publishing industry, tiny. Um, so there, there aren't that many new books. Um, and I guess my, I tried hard to like read everything I could that was available in the U.S., 25 years ago, right? Um, and that didn't take me very long. <laughs> and so um, now there's much more available and trying to keep up with everyone who's publishing out of Sri Lanka is could be a full-time job. So I guess my question is your work, do you feel like it is in, who do you feel like it's in conversation with? Okay, that's my question. <laughs> um, yeah. A, yeah, I think, um, you know, right now in Zimbabwe, it's a lot of like literary fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, especially that is like broken out into international markets uh, mm-hmm. and not so much speculative fiction. There are speculative uh, fiction writers like um, Tendai Wu Chu, uh, he's written the library of the dead and the headdress of Harare. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot of speculative fiction. It's more literary. And I think it's going back to that kind of stigma against speculative fiction It's you know, African mm-hmm. writers are trying to assert themselves as, you know, serious uh, writers so literary fiction mm. and talking about you know colonial history and you know the dictatorship is kind of like the way to do it but the way I approach mm-hmm. it is talking about all those things but using you know the fantastic uh to do it mm-hmm. um some writers that I think my work in is in conversation with is no violet uh blue oil uh her book that came out this year glory explores you know the military coup that happened that deposed uh Mugabe and it's so mm-hmm. interesting because you know uh, normally she's like a literary fiction uh, writer, but this is more fabulous. Um, mm. So it's like, um, it's been, you know, described as like an African animal farm, but I think, you know, that's huh. kind of like reductive. Uh, so mm. it, it does use, you know, animal characters, but it's coming from the storytelling tradition of, um, you know, Ngano and Ingwane Kwane, which are these um, oral f- uh, fables, oral fabulism. So she was drawing from that to understand uh-huh. this political moment of, you know, the coup. Cool. So uh, I really, really love, you know, that mm-hmm. book. And I and I love to see that this, you know, great literary fiction writer um, mm, was yeah. using, you know, fables, using right. the fantastic and the surreal to understand 
uh, this political moment. And I think it was uh, one of the Booker Prize um, finalists um, this can you, year. Can you, can you say could, could you say the title again? Uh, it's Glory by No Violet Bulawayo. Thank you. We're, we're going to get a book list from you and attach it to the show notes, but um, because I think there's a lot that I need to touch on. Um, yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I want you to continue. I guess, you know, I almost want to crank it whoever told you not to submit genre material to uh, <laughs> MFA programs only, only because I, I, I do think they've gotten better and I think people are carrying around something of an idea of the way things used to be. And I say this because like I had a Clarion student, EJ Fisher, who was my student in 2009, and he went on to apply to the IO Writers Workshop and he applied with genre, with science fiction. He wrote science fiction when he was there. I think they had him teach some afterwards, if I'm remembering mm -hmm. right. And so I, it, it, I'm sure it differs program by program. And so I guess I would say, it probably is good advice to find out for the programs you're applying to how open they are to that. Um, and it it's certainly true that when I applied to my PhD program, I, I showed my work to one of the professors there and she was like, you know, I don't know if this is for you. It's your work is is very polished and and uh, sort of commercial. Um, mm -hmm. And I think was sort of her code for like this. Is, I don't know if this these themes Too are li literary enough for us, right? Like how can, yeah. how can how can rocket ships or whatever be and dragons be literary? Um, mm. But but I think it's changing pretty rapidly, right? There's kind of an old guard, and then there there's. <laughs> Okay, hey, but I want to hear the rest of the influences question answer because I don't think I think, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that was I think there was more. You were going to say more. Yeah, or yeah. What kind of uh, in dialogue with. Yeah, um, and you know other literary writers, uh, uh, Petina Gappa, her, her stuff mm -hmm. is uh, you know not fantastic, but I think it does have a little bit. Like I was talking about that, there is you know those like mythological beliefs that they're sprinkled mm -hmm. in there. So mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people do do not consider themselves speculative fiction uh, writers, but they are kind of engaging uh, with that material. And um, yeah. the one that I love is her. Um, a uh, linked short story collection called uh, Rotten Roll. That's by uh, Petina Gappa. Uh -huh. And then um, there's uh, the last one that I'll mention is uh, Ignatius Mabasa. So he, um, what he does is really special because uh, I mentioned uh, Ngano, which are these, you know, oral fables coming from like the oral tradition. And so he records himself on uh, on YouTube. Um, oh, yeah. You know, mm. Performing that. And that's, uh -huh. you know, the kind of like our traditional storytelling. So I appreciate that because you can uh, go to YouTube and see his videos. And then he's also invested in translating those fables to the page so they mm. can be passed on, you know, to future generations. So I feel like he's kind of doing this archival work of preserving, you know, those mm. you know, stories yeah. and, um, you know, he, you know, he's still performing them, but now we have a yeah. record of it on, on YouTube. That's, uh -huh. That makes me wonder. So do you feel that when that, because you, you describe yourself as a storyteller um, as, mm. as part of your bio, do you feel that, that some, is anything lost in that translation from the oral to the written, um, and I ask in part because I'm thinking about, you know, when we when we teach like Survey of American Lit, we used to start with white men, and the Norton Anthology has since revised itself many times, and now it starts with um, Native American stories um, that are from an oral tradition, and I, I think they're doing a really good job of trying to present them, but but some of those stories. Uh, we only have because they were written down by a particular white man whose name I'm forgetting, right? And so what we have is that lens um, on these this oral tradition. So maybe, I don't know if you could just talk about that kind of thing. Um, yeah, um, I guess I, I think it's like necessary for us, you know, to write it down because, you know, I'm hungry to learn, you know, about, you know, more of them. And I think, 
watching like the YouTube videos, uh, Ignatius Mavasa's uh, YouTube videos has been, you know, helpful to kind of, you know, learn about some of those stories because I only have the ones that, you know, my grandparents, you know, told me mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know, and it's interesting to see how like they change depending mm-hmm. on the story. Yeah. Because, you know, somebody else, you know, brings in, uh, you know, their own uh, aspect or a different ending. Mm-hmm. Um. So, yeah, I, so I do appreciate like the work that, you know, Ignatius Mavasa is doing to um you know preserve and archive you know these stories um mm-hmm. and i think that preservation work you know should come from within the community cuz you know mm-hmm. like you were saying like with the you know native american ones you know it's like oh it's when the white man you know wrote it down that you know we have it and i think mm-hmm. um you know when that happens i think you know there <laughs> i think you know something is lost cuz you know we don't know you know how he translated it and Mm -hmm. what he you know embellished you know or Mm -hmm. changed so i think having you know uh storytellers from that community doing that work is important uh yeah yeah Yeah. i I like i i i mean i I guess to clarify my question too i mean it's obviously like writing it down and having it not be lost is worthwhile Mm -hmm. right If, if the alternative is to have it be lost right it's it's better to at least have a written one even even maybe a mauled written one (laughs) but um but hopefully we don't have to make those choices anymore right now you can have him writing down a version of it and the youtube video of him telling it so you can get those extra channels of meaning i guess is you know kind of like seeing but like i'm standing here talking i'm sitting here talking and like waving my hands around um so for anyone watching the the podcast yeah yeah we'll come across (laughs) the podcast but like but that but but for anyone watching the video right like there are so many cultures where when you're telling a story like your your facial gestures and your hand gestures are part of the storytelling right so uh, i mean well and it's such the other thing that struck me in what you were what you were saying is interesting because well there's there's one aspect which you said is like they are people doing it themselves or is it being like, obviously there's a lot lost if somebody from outside is trying to capture when they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Um, But even to write it down, I, you know, that's interesting that there was in the ancient world when writing was spreading, there was all this resistance and there's all these people like Socrates and like the, the rabbis of the Talmud and, you know, who are like, don't write this down. That will destroy it. Like you will miss the entire point. And what, all we have left is, writing written down them saying that <laughs> you know what i mean like what we have is the written document of them saying don't write this down like there's a paradox in a lot of sort of early writings of that era well and um yeah well i was just gonna say i think i think some genre people have i'm sorry i'm gonna blank on her name um native american writer um who has run into some tension around this because um things you're not supposed to write down Things are not because they're sacred, right? Things yeah, that, yeah. Um, well, then and, that's a, a whole thing is like what's 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 meant to be public and what's what's secret or or only mm-hmm. reserved for an, a group. Um, but even stuff that was generally like supposed to be taught widely, but but it was different having someone actually tell you in person versus once it's written down, it can't. And the I, you know. Um, and I don't know, just the very the, the fact that you were saying, well, it's interesting to hear these versions because they're different than the ones that I heard at home. And it's like, well, the interesting thing is if there becomes a canonical YouTube version, even if it's like a completely authentic version, you have all the gesture, whatever. Well, now there's that version, whereas pre- previously the next storyteller would have inevitably told it differently. And the next storyteller. The next, so, you know, even even like our notion of authenticity is sort of related to like it being stable. But there's something about an oral tradition where that's like, the, you know, like the authenticity is in it always changing in a way. So, you know, All I don't right. know. So I got to say there's a Star Trek novel that explores this in beautiful detail. Janet Kagan's Uhura's Song, which is my favorite Star Trek novel. Um, <laughs> and I say this having read many. So, you know, I have a good sample size. Um, but she has a culture that has perfect recall, not just like everyone in the society has a perfect memory uh, for auditory things, not visual, like a map. They wouldn't necessarily, but auditory things and also sense. Um, and mm. uh, and so and they don't have a written uh, tradition. And so when they what she kind of argues happens is that um, even in this oral tradition, when things get passed down, they get passed down in a very fixed way in that they are told exactly the same and with the intonations, with the gestures, et cetera. And it actually allows for less um, interpretation 
than you would get from a written tradition, which is a more stripped down kind of bare bones version of the story, right? Um, so I don't know. I, anyway, if you're interested in this topic, I, you could go read the novel. So. <laughs> but it's also true that it, it is also interesting that in ancient technologies, there's a little discursus, but like they, that there were also other technologies other than writing for preserving things accurately. Mm -hmm. And there are traditions where things were just told and every storyteller was meant to in, in, do them. But then there were also traditions and the interesting, like the V in the Vedas, um, mm -hmm. they they literally learn them literally backwards and forwards. Because if you learn mm -hmm. it backwards, it's got to be the same. You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. So if you memorize it, each word yeah. backwards, like, whereas you're likely to paraphrase, if you just memorize it and then retell it, you're likely to simplify it. But by memorizing it, it's like a parody checking, you know? And also like mm -hmm. the way the way that a lot of ancient literature is like rhyme and meter. And, you, you know, it's like, you can't get the words wrong because then the meter won't match. So, the, you know, all that stuff was like to preserve it accurately anyway whatever um <laughs> i'm curious because we've we've talked about um you know the you know when you talk about going to clarion and geeking out about about the dragons with everybody and um and since marianne is geeking about all the star trek she novels she read when she was a kid i'm interested in like that and but also you're talking a lot about drawing from you know the these other traditions like the storytelling traditions like the stories you grew up with um i'm interested in that uh, in that interface of like, what did you grow up reading and how much, you know, cause I, I think you're drawing on multiple traditions and like how much, you know, how does that, uh, how do you put those things together or like which things from outside influenced you versus from, you know, that are, you know, you, you know what mm -hmm. I'm, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, growing up with, you know, my grandparents and my, uh, my parents, there was, you know, the Gano, which is the oral fabulation. Uh, and I love those stories. Um, but then, you know, when I was in school, uh, you know, you start learning uh, English around like the age of six. Um, and, you know, my parents started teaching me earlier on. They, you know, they gave me books. I could pick up the language um, faster. So and all of those books were British children's stories. So um, a lot of Enid oh, Blyton, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh -huh. the the wishing chair <laughs> and all that stuff. So I think I kind of lost the oral tradition, um, you know, when I went into school, because it was now like, you know, British text. And, you know, throughout high school, it's still, you're learning, you know, the British classics, because, you know, we're a former British, Zimbabwe is a former British colony. So it was mm -hmm. mostly, you know, British literature yeah. that you're learning. Um, and so, you know, now, uh, you know, now that I'm, you know, when I was in my MFA, um, as well as, you know, what I'm writing now, I'm trying to kind of reconnect, you know, back with, uh, you know, the oral tradition and uh, putting, you know, the, the the myths that we tell each other every day into my work. Because, you know, when I fell in love with, you know, with writing, with the British literature, with the any Blyton's children's stories, I started writing from that perspective. You know, I'd never mm, seen yeah. snow and I was, starting, I was starting to write about snow. And when right. I wrote like my <laughs> first novel as a teenager, I was like, oh, you know, a novel cannot be set in Africa at all. Right. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's not possible. So I invented an island close to like America where, you know, there are these people who you know, were not black. And because I couldn't, because I'd been reading so much, you know, British yeah. literature and stuff. Yeah. I, I couldn't, you know, fathom uh, having yeah. you know, African characters. So I had to invent a place. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. You know, and, and that's you know, a classic stories. experience that so many people describe too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you know, and using like expressions that I normally wouldn't, you know, use. Like, how do you do? You know, nobody right. says that back home. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, that was you know that was in my story because I thought that's what a story was supposed right. to be. So right. you know, so now right now it's kind of like unlearning that and trying to you know mm. reconnect with uh, with my roots. Mm. That's really mm -hmm. interesting. Hmm. All right. I think um, we sh we have a tendency to ramble, but we are going to pause, I think, and do an intermission because it's intermission time. And then we're going to come back. And I would actually love to ask you two things. Um, I'd love to talk about feminism in your work and um, anger. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, the first couple stories really struck me as angry and so I'd like to talk mm. about that um yeah. which may have more to say about me than about the stories but, <laughs> but we'll come back right they made so, you angry <laughs> well more yeah. more like you know anyway we'll come back we'll come back so we'll be we'll talk about this more after the break Ta -ta -ta. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Great. All right. So there'll be a little uh, music edited in here. And then um, do you want to take five restroom, uh, refresh your beverage, and then we'll come back? Stretch. Yes. I need to stretch. So, Sounds okay. good. Thank you. Stretching and beverages. Um, oh, I, I was going to tell you, Ben, Beth Meacham in our conversation yesterday was sort of like anti-workshop. But I was like, but I teach so many workshops. And, uh, you huh. know, but she kind of feels like workshops one of the things that happens in workshops is that things get polished so much that the workshop often kind of, and I guess I've heard this about MFA programs before as a critique, but the workshop kind of polishes the liveliness out of the pieces. Yeah. Well, that's, and, I call that crit burn. Crit yeah. burn is real. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, yeah. that's less a problem with workshops than a problem with you, how you might use workshop. You know what I mean? Like it, yeah, yeah. it's a dangerous tool. Like many things can be used for good or ill. Like, yeah. and, and I think we've talked about that a little, but it's good to, we could talk about that on air. Like, like how to avoid crit burn is an important, you know, because okay. he can, you can, you can just smooth out everything and make sure nobody in your workshop has any objections. And at that point you've killed yes. <laughs> by the time everybody's satisfied, it's dead. You know what I mean? You yeah. have to, to leave some rawness anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we come back. Are we back? I guess we're back. I guess we're sorry. back. We just kind of <laughs> faded. We faded back in. So um, but go ahead. Curious to decide yeah. when to roll the tape. Sorry, that's what, right. What were you saying? We were oh, talking yeah, about saying, crit burn. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you know back to like how workshop can sometimes like edit out the liveliness. I took like um a poetry ocean uh, a poetry workshop. Sorry, a uh -huh. poetry workshop with uh, Ocean Wong. And uh -huh. what he does is in the first three weeks of class, nobody critiques. You just read uh -huh. the work and talk about what are you observing? You know, what, uh, is, yeah. what is the flair of this writer? You know, do they use a lot uh -huh. of butterflies in their uh -huh. uh, the poems? Do they, you, do they like sonnets? So you kind of figure out what your classmates like, what is their lively thing. And uh, then after yeah. three weeks, that's when you move into critique because now you know what's their thing. So you won't try to like, edit it out of their work and I think yeah I think that was like really helpful like not moving straight you know knives out yeah <laughs> yeah and just reading people's work and observing you know what do they do yeah yeah yeah. and a lot of and a lot I mean in, a lot of times it's so easy to fall into the mode of like presenting people with like there's this problem there's this problem there's this problem and then people go and try mm -hmm. to fix all the problems and that's like you know, a, a, a very dangerous way to approach your work. I've, if you go to look like, oh, I got to fix all these, got to patch up all these holes. Like you're likely to, you know, yeah. I, I would, I wish people were more, would learn to be more descriptive. And like, if I like where essentially they're engaging with it being like, this is what I, this is what I felt while I was reading mm -hmm. this. This is what I think is doing that. This is what's going on. You know what I mean? But like, well, you know, I think the, like, you know, some, I, you some know. of like this is when Beth, when Beth was talking yesterday in, in the panel, we were she's talking about how often what she's doing is, you know, she'll be asking questions of the author, right, that she's working with. And she'll be saying, you know, you know, OK, I love all the stuff that you're doing here. This thing over here. What do you think about doing, you know, something like this instead to take you? And then the author, she said, will come back with like, oh, that's really interesting. I don't want to do that, but maybe what if I do this? And then you have a generative conversation that mm -hmm. then that then the author can go back and that'll influence their next draft, right? Like that'll yeah. feed. And that's easier draft. with just. I mean, that's easier as a one-on-one -on -one dialogue right. too. If there's follow-up response, is, well, and it, but... it is. But I also think like that was how my doctoral workshops were much more like that in the PhD program than the MFA workshops. They were much more like. We almost treated the work as, um, and I think that was sort of how we were told, like treat it as if this is a finished story that you read in a magazine, right? And talk about it the way you talk about it in a lit class. And what is the story doing? What are the interesting points? What are the, you know, like, um, and the, that gives a very different sort of framing for the author to, for the writer to think about the piece. So yeah. Um, I, I I found it helpful. It it doesn't work so well for a beginner intro to fiction class, right? Like the it, you do need people to be far enough along in their craft to be able to get what they need to out of that kind of conversation, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, <laughs> what were you gonna say, David? No, that's really interesting. I've never had a workshop like that before. I think that that's an interesting way to frame it, actually. And I think 
maybe more productive conversations can come out of that like treat this as a Publish piece and you know talk about what you're observing no I like that I might because yeah. I teach creative writing I might try to <laughs> weave that in you know and see how that I goes. think it, it's a very it feels like a very respectful approach too is mm. another part of it that I really like after you know enduring a lot of workshops in my MFA where people kind of came in with like I don't understand this or you uh -huh, know, uh -huh. you know the, right like, like fix it for me yeah, right. And this was more like, yeah, you know, like, here's the piece. I trust that it's doing something interesting. And let me see what I can get out of it. And, and, and then verbalizing that is, I think, often very helpful to the author who may have done those interesting things, but done them intuitively rather than uh -huh. consciously. And then yeah. when someone says it, you can be like, yes, that's exactly what I was trying to do. Oh, right. I was writing a gothic. I didn't realize. Okay. Now I can highlight those elements, right? Like I'll go back and do that in revision. Right? I mean, so, I do like when somebody can really articulate well what is going on in the story. Like what this, what is the story doing? I do feel like that's really valuable. And I could see how that approach of like treat this as published fiction and do a lit crit of it is um, can break out of the mold of this anti pattern that there were people are like, I didn't like this, fix it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, which I think is sort of a very reductive, right? Like that can be very deleterious mm -hmm. if it's sort of like, you know, everything or, or everywhere, you know, it, there, there is a way in which people approach things that they're critiquing, like they are coming in looking to find problems. And instead of, a, so that mm -hmm. getting them in the mode of like appreciating this for what it is, rather than coming in and being like, as soon as it, because it's a work in progress, as soon as it violates where they thought it was going for them to be like, but I wanted this, like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, Mm -hmm. I don't know, spoiled kid at Pizza Hut mode of critiquing. But but I feel like but I feel like um I don't know why Pizza Hut. Anyway, but <laughs> but I don't but at the same time I feel like the hesitation I got when you said that is that there's a certain like very heady intellectual way of relating to the text that's like that's like, no, we're gonna analyze this as if it's, you know, with our august literary hat on. And in a, I mean, while I think that's better than like, I don't like this, fix it. I, I think in a way what I want is also like people's visceral immediate. Like in some ways, it's often like in a way, my favorite critique is in a way a a not particularly like somebody who's who has the ability to articulate what they're experiencing of a of a of a of a pro, but is but is acting like a complete amateur in the level of like I want unmediated access to their brain. Like what I can't see is what did the story do in their brain right then? What did they feel? And so in a way, like I often, when people give me this three levels removed, like this is the, the sophisticated analysis. I like that, but I often have to work backwards to like, but where did you, what were you okay, experiencing but, moment but, by moment? But yeah. I think you're taking something different than what I meant out of, yeah. when I say treat it like something in a lit class, like in my lit classes, when we're talking about Octavia Butler, we have very visceral yeah. discussions of sure. people's reaction to her work and it connects to their own lives and yeah, yeah. you know etc it's not right it's not like theory based right it's, you're not saying is, be fancy i'm not saying be fancy i'm saying <laughs> yeah, i'm saying okay, like what is what's the story <laughs> doing what does it do for yeah. you what is like yeah, yeah. what are the exciting moments what are the right. you know right. anyway sure, sure. so yeah, yeah. yeah. I yes. had a question, okay. but you had some themes for after the workshop, but I also well, wanted I to say one other thing or some, some okay. themes for our part two of the conversation, but I also wanted to throw something in, which is it's kind of a, a, a cool moment because we, we, we had an episode recently where we talked about like opening the podcast to new people and not just having our friends on. And you are like the first person who uh, like essentially cold called their way onto this <laughs> podcast. I just want yeah. to recognize that because you just sent us a letter out of the blue and we were like, should we? And then we like, I don't know, we, we went and looked at some of your stuff and we were like, oh yeah, yeah, this sounds great. So <laughs> just wanted yeah. to note that. And I don't know how you came across it or what your, you know, like I'd love to know what that was like, what your mm. thought process was or whatever, but I don't know if it was just a stab in the dark, like why not? I, Sounds like there's a podcast I could, or if you, you know, or if you, something sparked it or whatever, but. Yeah. So I was, you know, listening to some of your episodes with Ted Chiang, George R. R. Martin and, you know, other mm -hmm. writers. And I was like, oh, you know, this seems like a cool podcast. I would, you know, love to talk to them about, you know, craft <laughs> writing. And I totally mm -hmm. believe in shooting your shot and DMing people. So I was like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, why not? And I've met, you know. <laughs> really incredible people by just reaching out and saying, oh, yeah. hey, I think what you're doing, you know, is cool. You know, do you want to talk to me? <laughs> and yeah, so that's how well I kind of like approached uh, this. <laughs> I, lo yeah. I love I love it. I need to do more of that. And it's 
it's hard. Um, it's hard for me. So I'm glad that I just like someone, just, you know, I've got a cookbook that just came out a couple of weeks ago and um, someone sent me a note saying, oh, you should DM so-and-so on Twitter. She writes food stuff for the New York Times. And I, it's yeah. sitting there in my messages. I've got her name. I've got her Twitter address. I don't know what to say. And I'm like, what, go what for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just just copy it. paste if that's emailed to us and that's change right. that's, the details. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. Now We're you have good. a template. I know we're all going to have to learn to do this better, I think. So, um, okay. Yvette, who is obviously very good at uh, it. Yvette's got it down, right? So, yes. And uh, if anyone's listening, we do, I believe, have contact info on the site. You can contact us. We yeah. will consider, you know, having yeah. you on the show. I mean, you've if I get be... a flood, we may, we may flounder. And, and I, I mean, uh, you've got to be, you've got to be as cool as Yvette. But I mean, I mean yeah. that will be hard. <laughs> that will be tough. <laughs> got to be seventy-five percent as cool. No. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now when so I say I'm that, everyone ask- who doesn't get on is going to be, you mean you think I'm only 74%? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I want to go back to, I had two topics. Um, one of them was feminism. One of them was anger. Um, I think I can connect actually the anger to the workshopping thing we were talking about before. So let me start there. Um I feel like sometimes in workshop, uh, you get pieces submitted that are outside of the general workshop's comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And that can be a kind of dangerous moment in a workshop. If you don't have an instructor or community culture that like knows how to handle that, uh, you can end up with the writer kind of getting shut down, not getting anything useful in terms of feedback because people are so busy having their own personal reactions to mm. to the material, right? Um, I'll give an example, right? I was at Clarion and I had a workshop where I submitted a story with a sexual assault in it and the main character became aroused at one point during her assault and was trying to like navigate that. And I had like, 15 critiques out of 17 one after another who were sort of upset about this and then the 16th person was someone who had like me done some work in domestic violence arenas and she was like this happens this is a thing just because you guys don't know about it you know and and it was one of those like it, it was it, in retrospect there are better ways to handle this right um and mm. I when I was reading your stories, the first couple struck me as really angry. And then I had to kind of pause and be like, is this that the stories are angry or is it that I am uncomfortable with completely justifiable anger, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, like, am I just having a personal reaction here? And I think I was. I think I'm, you know, I'm very conditioned to huh. not expressing anger, right? And so maybe could you huh. just, talk a little about sort of I don't know any anything there that that strikes strikes you both about whether it's about workshop or the you're writing the pieces um is my take on it completely off and you're like they're not angry at all no (laughs) they're very cozy happy stories Uh, this is cozy fantasy (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) uh yeah I think you know they are angry because you know a lot of the times so my work comes from, you know, engaging with uh, things that are happening in the world. Um, so, for example, uh, one, this is not uh, a rage, a feminine rage one, but mm-hmm. uh, I read like a newspaper article uh, back home. There was like a, um, a a construction project that was happening to build a hydroelectric dam. And that would, you know, bring more electricity and that sort of stuff. And then the workers uh, went on strike and they stopped working and they refused uh, to continue because they thought they they said they saw something in the water that was suspicious um, and they thought it was um, a mermaid. And so they say this is a sign that uh, this wow. is wrong. This is going to destroy the environment. So these workers became environmental activists, basically, because mm-hmm. they. Mm-hmm. saw something sketchy in the water mm-hmm. that this is an omen that you know we shouldn't do mm-hmm. this so i kind of you know 
took that and, you know, wrote like a mermaid story talking about the environment and climate change. So my work comes from, you know, things that happen in the real world where, you know, the fantastic is rubbing on the mundane. And one of those stories, like the first story in the collection is a uh, red cloth white giraffe mm -hmm. um, and engages with um, the practice of the bright price uh, mm -hmm. back home, which is um, dowry. So the bright price is when, uh, the groom and his family pay uh, a certain amount of money and groceries and other items to the bride's family for mm -hmm. um, their hand in marriage. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this practice is fine. Like, you know, back in the day, it wasn't really like about money. The uh, the groom could come with, you know, uh, 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 like a, a bag of, um, you know, maize or he could come with, you know, a um a spear and give it as a gift. So it was more about like a gift to the family to uh you know say, oh, you know, thank you for you know raising your daughter, you know, I want to marry her. So it was like a nice gesture. But now, you know, with capitalism, you know, modern society, pe people have kind of used it as like a cash grab, like, oh, I have a daughter, somebody wants to marry her, you know, th this is the big <laughs> yeah. amount of money that you have to pay for a hand in marriage, whereas before that it wasn't like that at all. So, you know, I as, you know, angry about this tradition and a lot of times people are forced to pay in installments because they can't pay, you know, mm -hmm. an exorbitant amount of, um, uh, of money. So they're doing it in installments. So what happens is if the woman dies before the installments are paid, sometimes the bride's family sees that as an opportunity to get the rest of the money for the bride price. And they do that by holding her body hostage, basically, like you can't, bury her until the entirety of the bride price is uh is paid off and you know so the story uh is you know about a ghost uh, and she's a ghost because her family hasn't buried her because her husband hasn't finished paying the bride price so you know she wants to move on uh but she can't move on because she hasn't uh been mm -hmm. buried and so you know that you know i was you know upset about that you know i was thinking of the question of you know who has ownership over black women's bodies, even in death, mm -hmm. because, you know, we have, you know, this character that has died, but she can't move on to the next step because, you know, they won't bury her. And it's because the husband hasn't finished paying the bride price. So uh, I think a lot of stories in that are kind of, you know, critiquing how a lot of traditional um, practices have been corrupted by, mm -hmm. I think both capitalism and col colonialism and kind of like talking about the horrors and absurdities of, uh, of patriarchy. So that's mm. kind of like how yeah. I approach you know, that anger. I thought the bride price is really interesting. It is, you know, it's the opposite of what happens in South Asia, right? With the dowry where, you know, it is, you know, potentially disastrous to have multiple daughters, right? Because the dowries have gotten so exorbitant, especially mm -hmm. if you are trying to marry up, right? If you are, you yeah. know, hoping to, you know, everyone's got their little bio data sheets with how many degrees their children have and so on and yeah. so forth. And you're trying to like, you know, get a husband for your daughter who's mm -hmm. a doctor, right? Or whatever else. And then, yeah. and so then the dowry that is expected is enormous right where where again traditionally if you go back far enough it, you have to go back kind of a ways but i think that the classic dowry would be much more something like you know here's gold jewelry for the yeah. bride that the bride would then wear and have and would also be kind of an escape route for her if she needed it right whereas now it's like all of these thousand dollar saris for the for the women in the family and and people will literally bankrupt themselves yeah. um, between the wedding and the dowries right mm -hmm. like um because the wedding also there's a lot of social pressure to have it be a very lavish affair right and yeah. so um people exactly so and 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 again like it's it's fascinating because it's who is this benefiting right like you know it's exactly it's generally not not the women right like it's it's yeah. not the bride who's getting something out of this right so yeah. um not yeah. necessarily the groom it's more like the elders in the hierarchy right mm. so yeah. yeah and and um you know a lot of like domestic abuse comes out of that situation because it's mm -hmm. like oh i paid ten thousand dollars mm. for you um so 
how come you burned the dinner tonight? You know, this is not right. a ten thousand dollar dinner. You know, and <laughs> there's, there's justification for domestic right, abuse. Right. You know, in that um, with yeah. that, uh, and there's also like the money goes to like the men in the family. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you're raised by, you know, it's usually, you know, your aunties that are there for you, you know, mm-hmm. when you're growing up who, you know, get you through things. So, um, you know, it doesn't go to the aunties who are there for you. It goes to the men who, you know, might have been absent, who, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, had nothing to do. A random uncle that you've actually never met is the one that's called to receive, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the money. So there's also that aspect of, you know, the women that have actually impacted you in your life are not recognized. Mm-hmm. I thought that there, you had a moment in one of your, you have these brief snippet kind of pieces as well as the longer stories. And there was one about a young couple and they're holding hands and they have to be careful about it because, and this is true in Sri Lanka as well, you can get arrested for um, for that kind of sexual display. And mm-hmm. so she she could be arrested as a prostitute because she's holding hands with, with her boyfriend, right? And so, mm-hmm. um, but there's, this interaction between them when he's noticing that her hands are not work worn and her knees are light light and not dark because Mm. she's not like scrubbing the floors on her knees and he's like why aren't you working harder and she's like well it's it's this very interesting moment of modernity right where she's sort of Mm. like well um you're going to be an actuary, I think it was, and you know, like we'll we'll buy a washing machine. And he's like, Oh, that's washing machines spoil women. And then he like drops her yeah. hand, right? I yeah. thought that was fascinating. It made me think about um the lion and the jewel, uh, which uh why am I blanking on the author's name? Classic play about uh in Nigerian play about uh, modernity coming to the village and what it does to react interactions between men and women and so um it really felt I don't know it was I was like I could teach just like that little piece would be a great piece to teach in a conversation with Lion and I also loved in that story this is just a formal thing but I loved in that story how it's like it's not and this is very sort of folk tale-y then it's never Mm -hmm. clear exactly if we're talking about the same characters from piece to piece but the things Mm -hmm. reoccur so in the end when the woman goes to get the lightning from the witch I mean I hope that sounds Mm -hmm. better and a woman goes to get lightning from which anyway the mm-hmm. the um but then it, you know, she's thinking about all of these things she wants to spare her daughter and a, a lot of them are taken from the other stories but it's not wasn't 100 percent clear to me like is this the same is she the same one who's holding the boyfriend's hand is she also the one with the egg like do you know what i mean like and so and so it's uh that's that's an interesting like there's an interesting i don't know literary technique there where it's sort of like um it's like polyvocal so it's these stories that are coming at you and they might be recurring characters or it might be like almost like a chorus of like these things are recurring and happening again and again in different people's lives. Um, and that was very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was, you know, thinking about that because, uh, you know, I, at the top of the story, I say true stories. And you yeah. know, all of these mm-hmm. are taken from, you know, the people I know or people in the community. So I guess I kind of wanted, wanted to show that that this keeps happening over and yeah. over again and you know the girl at the beginning of the story could very well be the mother at the end of the story who's trying to uh right get her daughter right mm-hmm. yeah the, is that the one i'm trying to think where is that the one with the egg and the orange is that the same that's also in is that in that one yeah, yeah. That's because one that's also merits. because and this is another thing i wanted to ask about that i mean because because it was interesting to me that they're not like some of the percent in zimbabwe but the thing about the egg was sent in Eswatini, right? Which is nearby. So there's sort of like, and then there's and then there's the one where they've immigrated to a country which is either South Africa, a, 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 a surrealistic mashup of South, of South Africa and America. So there's different, like, uh, I, I don't know if that's, uh, I don't know enough to know, like what kind of choices you're making in terms of setting them in, in the different places. But, mm-hmm. but um, I mean, all those, all, all is that a, re- is, they're true stories, but is Plum Tree a real place, or is that kind of an imaginative mashup of different uh, things? Yeah, Plum Tree is a real place. Uh, it's a mm-hmm. town uh, back in Zimbabwe, um, and yeah, so you know, a lot of them are set, you know, in Zimbabwe. But there's you know the one that's in Swatini. There's another mm-hmm. one where uh, there's a reference to Nepal. So sometimes uh-huh. my stories come out of like conversations with other yeah. women. So I uh-huh. have uh, a friend from Nepal and we were talking about um, oh, wow. how periods are treated in our culture. Yeah. 
Um, so, you know, for in my mom's generation, when you when a girl gets her period, she wasn't allowed to tell her mom because it was a shameful thing. So my wow. mom had to go uh, walk to the uh, to her auntie's house to go tell uh-huh. her, oh, look, look what I've done. Look what's happened. And then the aunt has to come back with the girl and, wow. you know, broach the topic with the mom. Like, OK, mm-hmm. the period has come. So the girl yeah. gets to talk about it. And there's all this huh. shame around it. And I was talking about that. And then my friend, I was from Nepal, was like, oh, you know, uh, in Nepal, when um, in certain regions, uh, girls are not allowed to sleep in the house when they're on their period. They, mm. There's a shed, they have to sleep outside. And, you know, in some rural areas, they're wolves and um, right. some of the girls like, get attacked. <laughs> that was very, that's a great line. Like, and then the Himalayan wolves take wolves. them away. That's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you Terrifying. know, I was, thinking, I was thinking about that, like, you know, kind of like that intersectional experience that, you know, mm-hmm. this is happening in Zimbabwe. This is happening in Nepal. This is happening in Sweden. And it's all these yeah. different experiences happening. But it all goes back to the same thing, that there's this shame around, uh, you know, a bodily mm-hmm. function like a period. Yeah, I, I feel like the the shed thing, I feel like I've read about that in many cultures, including like Jewish cultures in some parts of the world as well, that, uh, yeah. that you... Are separate. Well, there's the famous, I mean, Ania Diamant, the red tent is kind of a story that flips that on its head, which is a, is a novel that takes place in the Bible. So it's like the, mm-hmm. it's like a novel about Jacob um, and Leah and Rachel mm-hmm. from the biblical story. Um, but it's kind of like, it's interesting because the, so yeah, in the Bible, it's like, well, women have to be, when they're menstruating, they have to be exiled to a different tent but in the in the world of the novel the red tent is like this amazing place like the women are like super psyched because all the all the young prepress girls wait on them and this is like the only break they have like the rest of the time they're they're like working laboring you know, back breaking yeah. labor but like when they're exiled to like to mm-hmm. like the tent they like chill and like tell stories and so that's kind of the the, the centerpiece of the the novel is it's like the frame tale of like how they i mean it was not a frame tale but anyway they they tell all these stories there and it's like this place of connection and solidarity so it's kind of interesting that mm-hmm. she like you know inverted this expectation that you get reading this very the, the bible as this very patriarchal narrative is like the woman is unclean but like you know so her take on it was like that the women are kind of like oh totally i'm i'm unclean so we're gonna go <laughs> <laughs> i gotta lie down and yeah. talk to my friends because i'm totally unclean you wouldn't want me near i'm gonna you can you can handle this right i'll i'll, I'll be over being unclean you know so anyway <laughs> it's a it's a lovely concept i i suspect it is rarely that you know, like it, it doesn't yeah, actually work that way most of the time is my guess. I mean, it's it's interesting when you, you know, in Sri Lankan culture, when a girl gets her period, they throw you a party, right? And my mother actually apologized that we weren't having, she wasn't throwing a party for us because uh-huh. we were in America. We didn't know enough people to do this. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, and I, of course, grew, growing up in America was like, please do <laughs> not have a party <laughs> right, announcing right. to the world that I have, I'm now a Which woman. is also like, so which yeah. culture has shame about this? If like, if yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like the American yeah, yeah, yeah. teenager is humiliated at the thought of anybody knowing. That's, well, but, you know, but also, also well, I mean, the, but, the per- but the purpose of the party, right, is to announce that you're of marriageable age, right? That uh-huh, you are sure. now on the market, yeah. right? It's like the Sweet 16 yeah. party and the yeah, Quinceanera yeah. and yeah. the debutante sure. ball. Like all of those are part right. of that same tradition of like, all right guys she's she's available now right so make your offers so i don't know that the party is necessarily a positive thing is i guess what i'm saying right like, i mean like I, I feel like a lot of these things frame, live in they, different yeah yeah they frame it as a positive thing but i was i was 10 at the time and i was like absolutely right. no way no how you know yeah, do I yeah. want anything like this yeah. right like um so and but of course like my grandmother was married at 12 if i remembering right mm. so she didn't go to his house right away but i mean the marriages happened much yeah. earlier so right um back in the day so lots of your stories about just to go back to it address that kind of issue so i guess i, I mostly i want to say if you're if anyone's listening is interested in you know you're putting together a syllabus on like feminist speculative fiction take a look at this there's there's several pieces i think that would work really well i wanted to another thing i wanted to talk about to go back to the diaspora piece is this idea of the responsibility of those who have escaped perhaps um, to those back home. And I'm thinking of your ugly hamsters Mm. story primarily. Right. And, um, uh, and it's, 
it was it was a heartbreaking story. I I really I was so moved by it because it you you give us this this you know woman in the states who's sending money back to her family which she can't really afford to do. She's giving up her food money because she knows of the poverty back home and then she gets a um a stroke of good luck, let's put it that way and um it does some nice things, like not nice things. She feeds herself and so on. But then at some point she does something nice for herself. And like, then the guilt overwhelms her. And then yeah. she starts sending all the money back home again. And it, it's just kind of crushing. And then she, then in the last stage, you take it up another notch. Um, and um yeah. So maybe if you could, I don't know. Your endings about... tend not to pull a lot of punches. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Like, you know, what kind of person are you? You can, I you can rest. Appreciated. You know? Like the, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. The fact that, yeah, you it's know? like there, there, I, I, and, and I, I had that experience reading a lot. Well, uh, that similarly, as I was saying to the end of second place of the first literature, I was like, oh, is this going to end with like a reconciliation? Is this going to be like, are you going to kind of tone it down? Nope. <laughs> like the end yeah. yeah could you talk a little bit about the sort of that relationship between diaspora and the people at home and the i mean the scale of the poverty especially with the i, I know one thing that that makes it um much uh the money goes so much further back home right yeah. because of you know global exchange rates right so you're like i could buy a five dollar thing here or if i send it there it's fifty dollars or five hundred dollars in purchasing power right and you know that um i don't know it, it becomes difficult to navigate so right so every talk. coffee you buy you're like this would be <laughs> like you know like when I, when I went to sri lanka like i was working in a cafe at one point on my laptop you know working on a, a book and and then I had this just moment of like, okay, this laptop was hard for me to buy. I had to save up. I was a grad student. I didn't have a lot of spare money. It was, you know, a thousand dollars or whatever it was. Right. And then like the waiter, like brought me a coffee or something. Like I'm at some Starbucks like place in the capital city and he brings me a latte and I'm thinking like, he should steal my laptop. This is like a year's income for him, right? <laughs> I mean, like, why wouldn't you? <laughs> you know, um, so it's it, the 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 scale is so insane, right? So anyway, sorry, I'm just babbling, but it's um event. You <laughs> you talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with uh with that story, I wanted to explore like um both like diaspora and black text that mm -hmm. um, you know, actually can you could you explain black tax too? So yeah, um, so black tax is a ph phenomenon where if you know somebody um, in the community like makes it, or you know they kind of like you know get a job or they get an education, um, you it's your responsibility to give back uh, because mm -hmm. you know other people in the community might not have gotten uh, those opportunities. Mm -hmm. So if you have you know a good job, a good education, whatever opportunity, then uh, you have to send money back to, you know, for school fees for other people, send money back for uh, hospital bills, for groceries, because, you know, it's your responsibility as, you know, the person who's gotten access to um, other things. So that's, you know, I think Black text and dias diaspora text are kind of like the same, mm -hmm. like the same thing where, uh, whereas, you know, now it's now you've kind of gone to America, which is kind of this land of milk and honey or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, um, so now you have to send stuff, um, you know, back home to help. Um, so yeah, I wanted to kind of talk about like the burden of that, like, you know, mm -hmm. you want to give, you know, back home, but you know, at what point does it get too much where, you know, this character is depriving herself of a winter coat. She's, you know, living in, mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts, which is, mm -hmm. you know, very cold. She doesn't have sturdy winter boots because she's sending all that money back. And then mm -hmm. when she does do something for herself, that guilt. Yeah. And I think she goes for like a massage or she gets mm -hmm. herself a winter coat and she's like, you know, this is selfish. I have, you know, all this stuff. I need yeah. to, you know, send it back. So I wanted to explore, you know, the guilt, you know, that comes with being the one that's made it out 
Uh, and mm-hmm. also kind of like the burden of that responsibility of making sure that other people are, um, are all right as well. And I guess with like the ending, I don't know if this will be like a, a spoiler. So that <laughs> that character does um, does die. And and then we see that this system is kind of like a. Uh, it's like is celestial the right word. Uh, it's kind of like it's mm-hmm. on this. This corruption is at a god level that right. gods mm-hmm. are behind. You know, generational wealth. They're behind poverty, and there's this corrupt mm-hmm. capitalist god system. And she has the option to choose whether are you going to be a hamster and work to generate this money that will go back to the people that are living. So it's kind of like diaspora and black text, but at the spiritual level. So yeah. are you going to mm. work forever in the yeah. afterlife to send money back to the living? Or are you going to choose to rest? And that's like the choice that she's faced with. And, you know, choosing rest, you know, it'll be good for, you know, her body, for her mind. But is it a selfish choice to choose to mm-hmm. rest? And, yeah. and and those are the questions that people in the diaspora and, you know, people in the black community have to ask yourself like is choosing not to send money is choosing to say i don't have that money right now is that a selfish choice to choose risk Mm -hmm. or will you keep on you know running in the hamster wheel you know to you know make sure that other people are okay well and i think as an artist right that's a i'm not saying particularly acute but but one one way in which that's acute is if you are sending all your surplus right every bit of surplus you have back you're not you're you're hamstringing yourself is i guess part of what you know is the risk is that you know that maybe that means you don't have the resources then to go to a conference that might advance your career you know or you or buy a laptop or whatever you know whatever it might be and so there is a kind of like the if the short term need back home is so great that um even if you know that long term right maybe it's better for your community if you invest in yourself and your work and you you know give yourself your best chance to have a a broader global visible reach right i mean that would also be very good for your community right but it's yeah. but it's a it's a tough emotional thing to navigate because you're sort of I mean that's a gamble there's no guarantee right it's not like going to med school you will at the end be a doctor right like it's the yeah. arts the arts are not predictable in that way right so it's um and then so when you have, you're like when you like weigh, weigh the options of you know should I go to Worldcon or mm-hmm. should I send money for a mm-hmm. hospital right. bill you know obviously yeah. going yeah. to Worldcon now seems kind of like frivolous even though it's not frivolous but it does seem mm. frivolous when you weigh it against like yeah. should i send money for school fees for my cousin who yeah you know, getting right. an education would help him you know yeah. Uh, so yeah so it's, it's kind of like that yeah. calculus of should i do this should i do that and both mm. both options kind of <laughs> lead you down kind of like a spiral yeah. of, of well, guilt yeah <laughs> this is why we need the the i mean I'm not saying this will fix it, but one thing that alleviates it a little bit is things like Connor Bust, you know, these these uh, community uh, endeavors to raise funds to make it possible. I mean, Worldcon had scholarship funds, you know, for, um, and we have to, you know, it's, it's difficult because there is shame attached to applying for that kind of thing. There's, you know, we have at the SLF, we have a working class grant um, and, one of the things we heard over and over from people was like, oh, I'm not poor enough to apply for that. Like there are people in more need than I am. And um, and we were always like, you know, you you qualify, please apply. <laughs> right. Like yeah. and and uh, it's it's tricky to and then and then there were also people who are like, well, I wouldn't, you know, don't call it that because people won't want to put that on their resume on their CV mm. that they got this because then it'll, hmm. you know, it they'll have to be coming out as working class, right? Mm. And so that was, and we, we couldn't come up with, this was like a, a tricky thing for us. We couldn't come up with a good name that mm. was both clear as to what the intent was, but had no stigma attached, right? Like mm. if, if anyone comes yeah. up with one, I'm happy to rename it. But like we we discussed it for a long time and then we decided to go ahead with it and we got some criticism from people who were like, you know, this is not 
a good enough solution and one like it's the best one we've come up with so far. I mean, one thing you could do, although this is the opposite direction from what everything has been going in fantasy and science fiction, but one way to to at least superficially solve that problem of it looks good on a resume and yet is clear is you could name it after some famous working class science fiction writer. And then like the subtext is, of course, like if, if you go and read their description, it's for working class writers. But yeah. if you just list it on a resume, it just says the so and so, you know, that is a good point, except that. Yeah, but. I, I don't know. I would be worried that people who are like skimming through lists of grant opportunities and so wouldn't on wouldn't necessarily. It, it's not they're they might not notice it because it's might just not. a name, right? So okay. I don't know. It's tricky, and and there yeah. is the issue of like naming it after people is. We should probably just stop. That's a little. Bit, <laughs> that's, that's, we're kind of phasing that out, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A little bit too diligent. I, I was trying to think like, is there a working class? Like somebody from fifty character? years ago. Probably well, there, anything's or, come out now that's gonna come out. I don't know. Or maybe a fictional character. You could do or something. Or maybe a fictional character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, who's a working class hero? Um, anyway, sorry. This is Katniss a whole, Everdeen. whole segue. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, it's interesting that you, uh, you, to get back to what you were saying, Marianne, about the like the first few stories were, were angry. I thought it was interesting that there was your reaction to the first few stories. That does make me think it's maybe you adjust, you like acclimating to the collection. Because I feel like throughout there's this combination yes. of like yeah. there's a lot of like joy and whimsy and like playfulness mm -hmm. i mean like in the in the first story that you said i mean it's like very dark in terms of like what's happening with the family and ha but also it's kind of triumphant at the end she sort of allies with this giraffe and like they're gonna mm -hmm. go kick some ass i mean it's like a buddy yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so clearly like you know they fight crime like the duo uh matchup i don't know and, and so i mean it's an interesting combination of like a lot of um, like the surreal and a lot of darkness and then also, but there's also like a lot of whimsy and, and like, um, and like these great hilarious images, like the people feeding organic dragon fruit to the ants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, and... yeah, go ahead anyway. Sorry. And cake. I mean like the cake and, and champagne and so baking on. Right? Cake for, baking cakes for the ants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the, you know, there's, Yeah. I love the way you spelled out the economics in that story too, right? The Ponzi scheme nature of uh, what they had gotten seduced into because <laughs> it's, it's just so prevalent. And so many, so many people I know do like, I mean, this, this happens everywhere, right? People sign up for like, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I live in a, a suburb, right? And like suburban moms who sign up for like, I'm going to sell these leggings and, yeah. you know, and it'll be a good income supplement for my family. But in fact, you have to buy all the leggings in advance and yeah. you're going to pressure all your friends leggings, to buy yeah. them and you you right. end up, and then you don't, you're encouraged, you, you are not encouraged to count your time as an investment, mm. right? Mm. And so, you know, if you actually counted your time, then you would be losing money. Etc. But women's time isn't worth anything um, in capitalism, right? So, okay, now I'm just ranting. But I, I, I agree that I was, th that was sort of my point is that like the first couple stories struck me as angry. I mean, she does become like an avenging ghost, right? Like at, in that mm -hmm. first story. So there, there's some, there's some. No, but through, but that's, but why the first but, couple? Yeah. Like there's. Well, no, no, that's, that was my point. That was my point. I think. Well, three stuff isn't I... angry. Get, I, no, that's know, a, that's what I of... think I had. I think I had to. Um, I, I think it was a personal thing. Like I had to reset my um, reading habits a little bit and be like, "Oh, right, right, okay." It is, of course, it's appropriate to be angry about this, and there is a lot of humor and a lot of joy and whimsy. And then, then I was fine going forward from that point. It was just a anyway. Which is interesting know, when you're putting together a collection and maybe this is worth thinking yeah. about, like, like how the order is interesting because in a way you're sort of teaching the reader what kind of a, you know, when you go into mm -hmm. a collection blank like this, not knowing the author, you're like, you're, you're, you're learning like the, the that's why I thought it was funny. You're like the first two stories I'm angry. I'm like the first two, but, <laughs> but, but you know, it's like, but it's like you're learning the collections teaching you it's register mm -hmm. or like what, what, right. you know, what to expect, what the language of the, of the, of the world is. Um, even though it's very all over the place in terms of genre, it also hangs together in a lot of ways thematically. And like, it does feel like, so did you, mm -hmm. did you think about kind of what came first, what came last, like how to pace it? Um, also, did you, did you get editorial input about that? Or like, who did you put the collection together with? I mean, maybe you could talk about sort of the process of creating mm -hmm. it as a whole. Yeah. Um, so when I was thinking about putting it together, I was actually thinking about the 
publisher because I sent it out to a university press and mm -hmm. you know in my mind I was like okay university press I have to slowly uh um what is it uh build them up to the more like uh mm -hmm. heavy fantasy stuff so yeah I started with the ghost story that's you know set in our world and then uh -huh. the second place is the first loser which is uh completely realist um yeah. and then the more fantastical um uh, stuff progressed yeah and so when I was working with the editors they were like oh you know we love uh we love the uh the current order so uh we mm. we kept it that way mm. only moved a few pieces around uh in the middle um and I, and also as I was you know thinking about how to order this um I attended uh, a reading um where I think uh Kelly Link and Holly Black were uh, oh, uh speaking wow. and I asked yeah. uh Kelly Link you know oh you know you've done a lot of short story collections and you're a publisher so how do you think mm -hmm. about uh, ordering uh, stories? Mm -hmm. And then she was like, I think about it from like a, like a marketing uh, point of view mm -hmm. that like the first story you're announcing to the world, like this is, you know, this is my style and that's your first mm -hmm. opportunity to grab the reader. And then the middle story uh, is also uh, a big uh, important one. And the last story is to close off, to kind of sign off like, oh, this is who, who mm -hmm. I am. And she yeah. said that a lot of reviewers read uh, the first story, the middle story, and then the oh, last wow. story. Huh. So make sure that you're hitting right. those yeah. <laughs> those points. So <laughs> I was like, okay, okay. So first story, kind of introduce myself. Middle story, yeah. you know, similar like pecks a punch, and last story, like signing off and saying, you know, mm. this is the last mm -hmm. thing you will remember about this collection is how yeah. I thought about organizing. Yeah. Wow. That's very mm. interesting. I had not heard that as a piece of advice, but it makes a lot of sense. Mm. Uh, so thanks. One other thing that we want to say before we go, we go is we were talking about, I was, I wanted to say this before we were talking about the Afro surrealism and the surreal in general. And it's interesting that mm. it particularly feels like it is a mode of response. Like, like there's, there's the folkloric um, and, and what we were talking about, about people using that as a metaphor to understand the world in a way. And it's sort of like it, it's sort of like, um, uh, you know, the meta, you know, the metaphorical or vivid mythical language. But there's also particularly with um, oppressive political situations, it feels like that. And there's something that felt I mean, I know this is this is very much drawn from from. Zimbabwe and tradition and everything, but but there's some felt like a parallel to a lot of the kind of Eastern European surrealism that is specifically about like how do you wrap your head around the absurdity of like living in a you know you know it, like the way that like per, often the surrealism um, appears in in this collection, particularly where there's like you know the government is twisting people into you know knots or or like the or like the naturalization thing with the with the uh, the naturalization priests where it's like this 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 surrealism that feels very much like how um you know kind of 20th century eastern european writers were often like this is the this is the most realistic way to talk about this situation mm -hmm. is for it to be sort of absurdly surreal like because that is a more accurate evocation you know mm -hmm. than than then just the de the realistic details don't capture the nature of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if yeah. you feel like that's uh, yeah, a natural that's, connection. Yeah, that's how I approach it. Because I think, you know, I've, I've lived like a really absurd life. And a lot of Zimbabweans have, you know, when we had hyperinflation, bread was a billion dollars. So I've been a billionaire <laughs> before, but right. I was poor. So you know, right. how do you wrap your head around being, you're a billionaire, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're poor as well and you know living you know under the same president all your life and yeah. you know it's it you know it, it feels like a horror movie you know you you can't speak about you know politics out in public you don't know who could be involved in the government so you know yeah it, it's to, to capture the reality you do have to go to the absurd because it, it's 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 a horror it's a horror movie so <laughs> it's a horror story mm -hmm. you know it's 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 you know the government are basically vampires, you know, sucking yeah. the blood out of the nation. So to capture that, you you have to, you have to go mm -hmm. to the absurd. That mm -hmm. actually, it reminds me of, you know, Amitav Ghosh has this set of lectures um, that he gave about climate change. And he's talking about how difficult it is for people to confront the reality that they just, they just kind of turn away from it, right? Like it does, it like it's it's too awful it's too whatever and and i think you know often when i'm reading about um pieces that are dealing with slavery indenture 
colonial horrors, um, the even even you know um, things like Roxane Gay when she's writing about um, gang rape, et cetera. You know, like mm. people have trouble, I think, with acknowledging the reality of how awful things can get, right? Mm -hmm. And so in all of these arenas, I feel like sometimes a useful move is to include a fabulous element just to almost, I mean, I'm thinking of that moment where the painter loses his eyes, right, in your story, and it 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 shocks us into paying attention, right, in a way that if it was just, I don't know, that they, you know, they took away most of his money or something, you know what I mean? Like it wouldn't register in the same way. Um, yeah. it, it, it has a more- But both shocking, I mean, if they gouged out his eyes, that would have been shocking in a sort of superficial sense, but, but like, it's both shocking, but it's also like, it's not just, it's not just shocking, like this is a terrible thing happening, but shocking, like um, disorienting, destabilizing, mm -hmm. like, wait, I don't know what's mm -hmm. happening. You know, right. in a way that like if the gouge out says you have a built in reaction of like, well, that's a terrible, you know, gory thing that's happening to other people at a remote, you know, you distance right. yourself from it um, like as a reflex of like, well, not, you know, oh, well, that's somewhere else. Terrible something happening. And like the 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 fact that it's the surreal that it's sort of this almost this moment of like, like, whoop, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like a, it's like a, a, a party magician's trick where they the priest passes mm -hmm. his hand over his eyes and then it's just blank skin. And, it, you know, it's sort of like it's it's it gets under your defenses by being more like a disorienting moment mm -hmm. in which you're not sure what to, you know. Mm -hmm. And also the, the fact that the collection wanders between genres means that there's this element of surprise where you don't know whether things are going to be, like if the first magical moment is also a moment of the story where you're like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. And, and I guess another thing that I wanted to uh, explore was like how we normalize the abnormal so like with, you know, with that story about immigration, you know, the immigration system, you know, separates families. It takes away so much from you, language, you know, culture, you know, yeah. you have to give up so much, your body, you know, your history. And so I wanted to talk about that, that, but it's a normal system. It's perfectly legal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things that, you know, happen in this world, we've normalized, you know, such yeah. terrible stuff with, you know, the, the story about the ants, you know, gig workers yeah. are treated like this, you know, think about Uber, mm -hmm. and yeah. all these places, but we've normalized that, that that's perfectly legal. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, using the absurd to show how this stuff shouldn't be normal, a, a president shouldn't yeah. be in power for yeah. 40 years, but we've, we, we've normalized that. And so using, you know, the, the spectacular kind of jars you and makes you think like, Wait, but this mm -hmm. is actually real. It's yeah. not <laughs> right, know, it's right, not right, fantasy. right. This stuff is real. Yeah. Yeah, this is stranging. And then it's another thing that you do uh, similarly, that's a technique in these stories, is that very often the narrator is like few of these narrators are like mouthpieces or figures of identification like very often the things that you're critiquing the narrators are vehemently arguing for so there's a very interesting that immigration story that it would have been very natural to write it with the main character kind of just you know feel, emphasizing this tragedy or like rebelling against it but the main character is like keeps assuring like very in a way that you know is heartbreakingly like unconvincing <laughs> like vehemently assuring herself and everyone around her that it's worth it that like the, the the thing that they're making which both i mean on the one hand feels um and, and not just that it's worth it compared to the alternative, because like, as I said, that's like, that is very effective in painting, like the place we don't see, the home that's become thorns, like as even worse, like it's like this dystopian story in, which is really about the even worse dystopia we're not seeing, um, but except through myth, but but also the fact that she defends it as like completely like worth it in its own terms, like it's it'll, it'll be fine, it'll, you know, is like part of the horror of the story, um, and I think there's a bunch of places where it's like you have the narrator sort of insisting on things, um, mm -hmm. the, you know, going against the grain of the story in a way, um, which, I, you know, which I love. And it's it's uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, and sometimes we don't none of the characters are like the one we're supposed to agree with. Do you know what I mean? Like like mm -hmm. in in uh, in the, the lift story, too, it's like, you know, 
we're very much in the perspective of the main character and very sympathetic to her. But at the same time, like her father's right in all of the things that he is like <laughs> critiquing her for. <laughs> so it's not like we're centered in like this is the person who's correct. You know what I mean? Like it's there. Mm -hmm. That's and that uh, that I think is a strength of that. So we should head towards wrapping up. Uh, so Yvette, I just wanted to ask you what you're doing next. Like what should, you're finishing up your MFA, your, this book, uh, Drinking from Graveyard Wells will be coming out in March. What are you working on now? Yeah, uh, so I'm currently um, trying to get through Revision Hell uh, for mm -hmm. um, an epic fantasy novel yeah. that's set uh, in a pre-colonial Southern African kingdom with three girls taking on the gods and the patriarchy. Um, and so I wanted to kind of, um, so there's this like 15th century um, ruins of a city um, back home in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's really gorgeous, these beautiful like stone ruins. And I'd never like, you know, really seen that medieval city in uh, fantasy before. So I wanted to mm -hmm. kind of set my story there and kind of engage with that. So I've been uh, I've been working on that uh, with revisions for that. Um, an excerpt of that story uh, was selected by uh, George R. R. Martin's team for the World Builder um, Scholarship. Okay. So nice. that's kind of given me a push to work on the edit. So in the coming year, I'll be working on that and hopefully uh, that I can send that out. Um, and I'll continue, you know, putting out stories. I have something coming from uh, Lightspeed. And I also want to work on some essays, you know, some craft things mm -hmm. to talk about Afro surrealism um, and the way I approach um, storytelling. Well, it's cool. been a total delight talking to you. And I'm warning you now, I'm going to be talking to you about maybe doing some stuff for the SLF. So, um, but I will, as, as, <laughs> ben, be will warn, as ben will warn right. you. Marianne has restrained herself because she has not launched any projects or tried to recruit you for any jobs so far this entire <laughs> podcast. I'm very proud I, of you, Marianne. I have been restraining <laughs> myself because I wanted to be sure we talked about her work, but I'm making a list of things I'd love her to work on. So um, so we'll, we'll follow up with that. But uh, but yeah, it's just been it's been terrific. I'm very excited to see um, how how things go as this comes out, and we'll be uh, linking to the stories that are already published so people can check them out. And very yeah. glad that you cold emailed us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Setting a good example, <laughs> so good example for yeah. for others. Um, uh, and thank you so much for having me. This has been like delightful to kind of talk in depth about those stories. And, you know, some of the things that you observed I had and, you know, thought about it consciously. I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. I was trying to do that thing. Yeah. <laughs> I always kind of love that. I love that when I go to a reading or something and a, a, someone asks a question, I'm like, oh, that was right. what I was doing. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. You know, like oh, yeah. I Sometimes I love I had not articulated it. I love yeah. when people tell me what's going on in a in one of my stories, and I'm like, oh, you're right. That is what's going on. Like, where I hadn't even seen, <laughs> like, even the content of the story where they're like, oh, no, this person, you know. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. oh, you're right. That That's now canon. Like, that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, they were lying. Oh, they were? Like, that's, mm -hmm. I love it. <laughs> readers are, uh, yeah. Yeah. Reinventing the text. Yeah. <clears throat> all right um yay thanks so much i guess we're wrapping up so uh, this is moan raj and rosenbaum are humans with yvette lisa nadlovu we were talking about her forthcoming book drinking from graveyard wells which is coming out in march 2023 so i'm marianne moan raj and... i'm ben rosenbaum yeah <laughs> and, uh... stay human or not yeah <laughs> <laughs>